Hi everyone. So today in this video, I will be going over Mendel's three laws of inheritance. And together, his laws really constitute the basis of the field of modern genetics as we know it today. So it's really important to understand his discoveries and understand how they inform our knowledge of genetics in the present day. So to begin, I just want to give an overview of how Mendel designed and approached his experiments. So Mendel used the common pea plant as a model system for his research. So in general, in biology, a model system is a system that is suitable or convenient for studying and understanding biological processes. This is because they have features that make them ideal for study. So specifically in this case, there are several reasons for why pea plants are suitable for genetic research and for why Mendel chose to use pea plants for his research. So they are easy to grow. They have a short generation time, so that means that we can observe the progeny of new crosses rapidly, and they produce a large number of offspring from each cross. This means that we have a large sample size that we can observe um, in order to find quantitative patterns that we, that we see in traits. So another important reason for why pea plants are useful for genetic research is because they have several visible characteristics that vary. So it's important for, for the pea plants to have different visible traits so that we can easily track how these traits are passed from one generation to another in order to deduce principles of inheritance. So Mendel specifically studied the inheritance of, several, of seven different characteristics, and each of those characteristics had two possible variants. For example, um, one of the characteristics he studied was flower color, and the two different variants for flower color were purple and white. And then also with pea plants, another reason why they are beneficial is because it's easy, it's easy to mate them in a controlled manner. So um, each pea flower has both pollen-producing male organs, known as stamens, as well as an ovule-bearing female organ called a carpal. So in order to pollinate flowers, Mendel tra transferred pollen grains, which are the male gametophytes, from the male stamen to the female carpal in order to fertilize the ovule and produce a zygote. The fertilized zygote then developed into a pea, which could be planted in order to generate the offspring of the mated plants. And there are two different types of pollination that we can have. There is self-pollination and cross-pollination. In self-pollination, the pollen grains are transferred to the carpal on the same plant, while in cross-pollination, the pollen grains are transferred to the carpal of a different plant. So we can either mate plants of the same type or plants of different types with different phenotypes. Also important to note is that Mendel established true breeding, also known as pure breeding lines. So a true breeding line is a line of individuals that, when crossed, always produce offspring with the same traits as the parents. So here on the right, we have an example of a true breeding line. In this case, the true breeding line um, consists of purple flowered plants. So we can see here at the top that when um, purple flowered plants are crossed, that they always produce offspring with purple flowers. We can see this in the F1 generation and again in the F2 generation. So here we can see that these, these true breeding plants always reliably produce offspring that have the same phenotype as the parents. And again, this is the definition of a true breeding line. So Mendel repeated this same procedure for all of the traits he was studying. So he established true breeding lines for all of the traits. Um, for example, he, uh, he had a line of true breeding white flowers in addition to his true breeding line of purple flowers. Um, and then also another thing that I wanted to point out in case people didn't know, um, these letters here, um, P, F1, and F2, these stand for different generations. So um, the P stands for the parental generation. This is the first generation of individuals that are mated. Um, the F1 stands for the first filial generation. These are the offspring that result from the cross of the parents. And then subsequent generations are labeled F2, F3, F4, etc. Um, and they result from subsequent crosses that occur. So for example, the F2 generation results from the F1 um, cross. Next, now I want to begin talking about Mendel's first exper experiment. So in Mendel's first experiment, he um, crossed two different true breeding lines. So here we can see that he crossed purple flowers 
um, and he crossed them with white flowers. So um, in the F1 generation, Mendel observed that all plants had purple flowers. Then when he crossed those F1 hybrids with each other, they ob he observed that in the F2 generation, um, three-fourths of the plants had purple flowers, while one-fourth of the plants had white flowers. So um, essentially, there's a three-to-one ratio of purple to white. And he repeated this for all of the different characteristics he was studying um, and observed these same results. So he observed in the F1 generation that only one trait appeared, and then he observed in the F2 generation that there was a three-to-one ratio of phenotypic traits. So before Mendel's experiments, um, the most popular theory at the time was called blending inheritance. Um, and this theory stated that offspring um, inherit characteristics that are intermediate between those of their parents. So basically, if this were true, the F1 generation should have had all purple, white, or pale purple flowers. Um, and then the F2 generation should have also had all purple, white, or pale purple flowers. Um, because again, the theory stated that the traits of offspring should be essentially a blend between the traits that are present in the parents. So if the parents had purple and white traits, um, purple, white would be an intermediate blend between those traits. The same could be said for all of the different characteristics that Mendel studied. So for example, for stem length, um, a tall and a short plant should produce a medium, plant, a medium um, height plant, according to this theory. So instead, obviously, we see that um, in the F1 generation that all plants had purple flowers. So he observed that parental traits remain distinct when they are passed from parents to offspring, and he developed his alternative model in order to explain these results. So from here, I will be talking about Mendel's model of inheritance that he proposed based on his experimental results. So basically, at the core of his model of inheritance, Mendel posited that characteristics are controlled by heritable discrete units. And at the time, he called these, he called these discrete units factors, but we now know them today as genes. So a gene is a discrete heritable unit of inheritance that influences a characteristic. For example, in this um, specific experiment, the gene that we are studying here is the flower color gene. Um, so this gene determines the flower color. Then an allele is a variant of a gene that encodes for a specific trait. So for example, for the flower color gene, there are two alleles. Um, there is one allele that encodes for the purple flower trait, which we can call the purple allele, um, and then another allele that encodes for the white flower trait called the white allele. Um, next, for each gene, an individual inherits two alleles, one from each parent. So this is true for diploid organisms, since diploids have two sets of chromosomes. Um, they inherit one set from each parent, so that means that for each gene, they have an allele from their mother, and then another allele from their father. Um, another note of terminology um, is that an organism that has the same alleles for a gene of interest is called homozygous for that trait. So for example, the true breeding flowers um, seen here um, in the parental generation are homozygous. So um, the purple flowers have two purple alleles, and then the white flowers have um, two white alleles for the flower color gene. So they have the same alleles at the gene of interest. Then an organism that has two different alleles for a gene is called heterozygous for that trait. For example, in the F1 generation, um, we see that the plants ha each had a white allele and a purple allele for the flower color trait. So we call them um, heterozygous. Next, Mendel came up with his first law, which is known as the law of dominance. The law of dominance states that in a heterozygous individual, meaning an individual who has two different alleles for a particular characteristic, the dominant allele is the allele which affects and determines the characters, the organism's phenotype, while the recessive allele is masked by the dominant allele and has no visible effect on the organism's phenotype. So by convention, the dominant allele is represented by a capital letter, while the recessive allele is represented by a lowercase letter. So we can see here in the F1 generation that 
All the plants had purple flowers because they inherited a purple allele and a white allele from their parents. So the allele for purple flowers is dominant, while the allele for white flowers is recessive. So that's why only the purple flower trait is expressed. And also note, um, like I said, the um, dominant allele is represented by a capital letter. So the, so the capital P represents the purple allele, the dominant allele. And then the lowercase um, p represents the recessive allele, the white allele. So um, because of this law of dominance, recessive traits are only expressed in homozygous recessive individuals who have two recessive alleles for that trait. For example, we can see here in the parental generation um, that these white flowers have um, two recessive white alleles, which is why they actually express the white color trait. So here I just have an overview of basically the terms that I described. Um, here they're basically shown um, through the schematic of chromosomes. Okay, so now I want to talk about the law of segregation. This was another law that Mendel deduced based on his same first experiment. So the law of segregation states that during gamete formation, each parent's two alleles for a particular gene segregate randomly into different gametes, such that each gamete receives only one of the two parental alleles. This means that each parent passes down to its offspring only one allele at random. So we can basically go through this same experiment again and explain the results that Mendel observed based on his law of segregation. So here in the parental generation, each true breeding plant is homozygous for either the dominant allele in the case of the purple flowered plants or the recessive allele in the case of the um, white flowered plants. So as we said in the law of segregation, only one allele is passed from the parents to the offspring. However, because the P generation consists of homozygous individuals, um, each organism always passes down the same allele to the next generation. So the purple flowers always pass down the big, the big P allele, and the white flowers always pass down the small P allele. So the F1 hybrids all have the big P, small P genotype. Then we can see the F1 hybrids undergoing um, fertilization. So when the F1 hybrids undergo meiosis, the two different alleles, the big P and small P alleles that are present, will segregate into gametes such that half of the gametes have the purple flower allele and the other half of gametes have the white flower allele. So this means that we can say that the probability that a given F1 gamete has the big P allele is 50% and then the probability that the F1 gamete has a small P allele is also 50%. So now that we have the probabilities um, for the different alleles being passed down, we can calculate the probabilities of, of observing the different possible F2 genotypes. So for the big P, big P genotype, um, an F2 individual has to inherit a big P allele from both the male and the female parent. So to calculate the probability of this genotype, we can multiply the probability that the offspring inherits a big P allele from the female parent, which is 50%, by the probability that the offspring inherits a big P allele from the male parent, which is also 50%. So we can see that the um, probability of having a big P, big P genotype is 0 0.25. Next, for the big P, small p um, genotype for the heterozygous individual, we have a similar procedure, but here we must consider that there are two separate situations that both produce the same heterozygote phenotype. So an F2 heterozygote with a purple and white allele can either inherit the purple allele from the female parent and the white allele from the male parent, or it can, it can inherit the white allele from the female parent and the purple allele from the male parent. So basically, we can see here that there are two possibilities um, for, the F, for the F2 heterozygotes um, to have that genotype. So because of that, we add the different, we add these two probabilities in order to find um, the total probability that um, an F2 um, organism will have the big P, small p genotype. So here we can see that once we add the probabilities for the two different um, possibilities, we have a overall probability of 0 0.5. And then lastly, we can repeat the same procedure with the small p, small p genotype. 
So um, again, similarly to the big P, big P genotype, there's a 0.25 um, probability of um, having that genotype in the F2 generation. So after calculating these genotypic ratios, these genotypic probabilities, we can also predict um, the phenotypic ratio. So according to the law of dominance, again, we expect that the big P, big P and big P, small p genotypes will both um, express purple colored flowers. Um, and then when we add their probabilities, we see that this is e that their probabilities equal to 0 0.75. Um, and then we expect only the small p, small p genotype um, flowers to produce the white phenotype. And then we can see that this has a probability of 0 0.25. So when we compare that, that's 0 0.75 to 0 0.25, which constitutes the 3 to 1 ratio. So um, this is exactly the ratio that Mendel observed in the F2 generation, as we stated. So we can see how Mendel's principle of segregation um, accounts for this 3 to 1 ratio that Mendel observed in the F2 generation. Lastly, I want to talk about Mendel's second experiment and how it relates to the law of independent assortment. So in this experiment, Mendel followed two characteristics at the same time. He studied both seed color and seed shape simultaneously in pea plants. And for these traits, um, Mendel knew which um, of the alleles were dominant and recessive. So for seed color, um, Mendel knew that the yellow allele was dominant and the green allele was recessive. For seed shape, he knew that the round allele was dominant while the, while the wrinkled shape was recessive. So first, in the P generation, Mendel crossed two true breeding P lines that differed in both of these two characteristics, um, differing both in seed color and seed shape. So one line consisted of yellow and round seeds um, having all dominant alleles, and then the other line consisted of green and wrinkled seeds consisting of all recessive alleles. Um, in the F1 generation, all of the individuals will have um, will have a heterozygous um, genotype at the two traits of interest. Um, so they will ha all have a big, big Y, small Y, big Y, small R. Um, and then we can carry out a cross of these F1 individuals to see how these different characteristics are passed from the parents to the offspring. So there are two possibilities for how the traits will be um, transmitted. First, we have the possibility of dependent assortment. Dependent assortment refers to a scenario in which the two genes are linked, meaning that the alleles for the different genes are transmitted as a unit in the same combination as they were present in the P generation gametes. So this essentially means that um, the Y, the big Y and big R gametes are always transmitted as a unit and the small y and small r gametes are always transmitted as a unit. This means that the F1 hybrids produce only two types of gametes, with 50% with of the gametes being um, big Y, big R, and then the other half of the gametes being um, small y, small r. So if we calculate the probabilities of the F2 generation phenotype, genotypes and phenotypes based on this dependent assortment assumption, we see that we expect a three to one um, phenotypic ratio. Um, and I'm not doing um, this in-depth calculation of the probabilities, but it's similar to the um, calculations I did on the last slide. So um, then other possibility is um, independent assortment. So an independent assortment um, alleles of different genes segregate independently of each other during my in, independent independently of one another during meiosis. So basically, this means that the segregation of one allele pair does not affect another allele pair. So this means that all possible combinations of alleles for different genes are equally likely to occur in gametes. So the F1 plant produces four types of gametes um, under this independent assortment assumption, each of which has a 25% probability of occurring. So we can use those probabilities for the F1 gametes in order to calculate the probabilities for the F2 genotypes. Um, so basically, you can see in depth here, um, they calculated the probabilities of the different F2 genotypes. Again, I'm not going to do this here, but it's similar to the calculations I did previously. So under the independent assortment assumption, the phenotypic ratio that is predicted is a 9 to 3 to 3 ratio in the F2 generation. 
Um, and the actual results that Mendel observed were consistent with this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, um, not the 3 to 1 ratio that was expected for the dependent assortment assumption. Therefore, Mendel concluded that um, the law of independent assortment was true. So the law of independent assortment again states that during gamete formation, genes for different traits segregate independently from one another um, and are passed independently of one another from parents to offspring. Um, last, I just wanted to go over some important cases of, of non-Mendelian inheritance. Um, so first, linked genes do not follow the follow the law of independent assortment. So the law of independent assortment only applies to genes that are located on different chromosomes or are located very far apart on the same chromosome. So it just so happened that all of the P characteristics that Mendel chose were controlled by genes on different chromosomes or again, were far apart on the same chromosome, which meant that they segregated independently of, each, of one another. However, for genes that are located near each other on the same chromosome, their alleles tend to be inherited together, so they do not sort independently. Um, and this is discussed in depth in Bio 1A later, um, and I'm, I'm not discussing it now. I just wanted to point out that the law of independent assortment does not always hold true. Second, Mendel's traits were controlled by single genes, but most human traits are polygenic. So in Men Mendelian in inheritance, each trait is linked to a single gene. For example, the flower color of a pea plant is entirely determined by one single gene. However, in reality, in um, humans, most traits are actually polygenic, meaning that they're influenced by multiple genes. Um, and in these cases, it's much more difficult to map and identify the specific genes which contribute to a poly to, which, compute, which contribute to a polygenic trait because so many different genes affect these traits. So it's important to keep these um, exceptions in mind um, and understand that Mendelian inheritance does not always apply. So um, that's everything I have for this video. I just wanted to go over the basics of Mendelian genetics um, and that is really important for understanding more complex topics in genetics. Good luck everyone!